Welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and I am so excited about today's guest because, well, it's interesting. (laughs) His name is Ellie Honig, and he spent 14 years as a federal and state prosecutor in New York and New Jersey, and much of this time was spent in organized crime taking down mafia, like major members of the big crime families. And Ellie now has taken all those stories of all those cases he covered for that period of time, and he's telling them on the podcast Up Against the Mob. People sometimes ask me if prosecuting the mob is like the movies. Well, there is violence. So I took a fork and I was going to put it in his neck. I said, I'm going to kill him. There are hits. So it wasn't just uh, permission to to take him out, but permission to take out his own nephew. And he went down there with a 45 Magnum, a very powerful, powerful gun. And of course, there are crooners and crooked unions. There's a beef over tickets to a Tony Bennett concert and no-show jobs in a union. But after taking down over 100 mobsters, I can tell you this. The real thing is better. I'm Ellie Honig. I'm a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Southern District is the New York Yankees. I mean, come on. My boss, Preet Bharara, publicly called me organized crime's worst nightmare. The Gotti family called me hotshot Honig. The best summation I have ever seen by a prosecutor was you. And you got up there and kicked ass. I'm the host of a new podcast, Up Against the Mob. This podcast will lift the veil on the world's most secretive criminal organization, La Cosa Nostra, the Mafia. We'll talk to undercover agents. These guys that I am laughing with would also kill me in a heartbeat. Mobsters who turned against their own. I made a bad choice in life, and, you know, that's what Daddy did. Prosecutors who put them behind bars. We weren't going to offer them a plea deal. It was going to be life without parole, period. He's crying. He's panicked. I turned to him and I said... The law is entitled to your evidence. We need it. Would it help at all if I gave you a hug? The lawyers who defended them. I'm there as Liberty's last champion. The psychologists who've analyzed them. There are shades of gray that there are these different relationships, and it humanizes them. And unlike Hollywood, all these stories are true. It is the closest of any case I know of that was like the real-life version of The Sopranos. New episodes drop every Wednesday starting September 8th. Listen and follow Up Against the Mob on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And let me tell you, this podcast is so entertaining and so informative. And I feel like I've come to my mafia interest a little late in life, to be honest. As a half Italian who grew up in New Jersey... I'm ashamed that I've never seen The Sopranos. I confess this to Ellie. I'm ashamed that I've never watched The Godfather. I'm ashamed I don't know more about mafia cases in New York City and New Jersey. Ellie's podcast, Up Against the Mob, was the perfect foray into this category. The episodes are fast-paced, and he has all the first-hand stories, and he brings in guests. But what's so interesting to me is that his podcast feels like the mafia counterpart to Dialogue. They're really exploring and unpacking why there's this cultural, societal, media obsession with the mob and the mafia. And they spend a lot of time talking about that. And that's what we do here with True Crime. So I loved that parallel. We discussed that. And also, I'm just going to say that I drew some cult parallels to the mafia. Am I saying the mob is like a cult? Yeah, I think I am. So that's why this interview is placed at the end of our cult adjacent series, because I think this is cult adjacent. I legitimately do. And it's a nice segue to our next series, which is things I'm reading and listening to podcasts and books up against the mob is a fantastic podcast worth your time. I will link to it in the show notes before we get to Ellie's interview. I want to just tell you books I'm reading because those are going to be the next several interviews as well. And I know some of you like to read along. So the books are The Officer's Daughter by L. Johnson. It's a memoir. And the next one is A Dark Room in Glitterball City by David Dominey. And that is a true crime Southern mystery. So both X 
excellent, excellent reads. Can't wait for you to hear the interviews. And the last thing before we go, I have a live show coming up. It's a true crime variety show, and I'm really excited because it's in person in New York City. So if you are in the New York City tri-state area, please join me on Tuesday, October 26th at 7 p.m. on the Lower East Side at a venue called Caveat. But wait, there's good news for you wherever you are listening from. This show is going to be live streamed. So that means you can come and watch from your home or your office or from wherever you find yourself Tuesday, October 26th at 7 p.m. It's a true crime variety show. There's going to be true crime trivia. There's going to be other games. There is a mystery guest, but it's not a mystery anymore. She is a New Yorker cartoonist, and she's coming out with a true crime graphic novel called Murder Book. Her name is Hillary Fitzgerald Campbell. Cannot wait to meet her. And there's going to be a true crime musical parody. So when I say variety show, I really mean variety. There is something literally for everyone. So please tell your friends, get some live stream tickets. And if you're in the New York City area, I would love for you to attend in person. Link to tickets will be in the show notes. And you can also find them on my social media pages and on my website, RebeccaSebastian.com slash live events. Now, let's get into this super fun, super compelling mob mafia cult conversation with Ellie Honig. Ellie, thank you for killing the small talk. Ellie, I am thrilled to have you on Dialogue Podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You know I love talking about this stuff, and and, uh, I'm thrilled that you've listened to Up Against the Mob, and I will take any question you have. Beautiful. Well, the first thing that struck me, we have to get this just sorted out straight away, is that I currently live in Queens, so I feel like, you know, I'm always looking over my shoulder, never know who you're (laughs) going to meet around here, but I'm from a leafy suburb in New Jersey, so I definitely want to compare New Jersey residences. I grew up in Princeton. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I am from South Jersey, Cherry Hill, and now I oh. live in Metuchen, which is sort of north of there. So you sort of grew up right in the middle. Princeton is is gorgeous and beautiful. And for those of you who are picturing Princeton at home, you're probably picturing Princeton University, which is what I picture too. And I'll just tell you, I went to Rutgers, which is our state university, sure. just up Route 1. Not, not I'll just say, I'll, I'll, I'll be fair both ways, not as prestigious, but also not as expensive. And I remember going to Princeton when I was at Rutgers. We all hopped in someone's car. I think it was Rutgers must have been playing Princeton in basketball and arriving on Princeton's campus and and looking around thinking, oh, my gosh, this is what colleges can look like. So, um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful city. Great town. Great place to grow up, I'm sure. It is. And it isn't what most people picture when they think of New Jersey, if they're not from the area. Right. So I, I have a lot of like, this is my New Jersey kind of pride. But Metuchen, I can picture on the Northeast Corridor line, you know, I went to college in New York City. So yeah. New Brunswick, Metuchen, like the whole way up, all the way to the city. But you're coming here by way of the podcast. We want to talk all about Up Against the Mob. But first, why don't we start with your career as a New Jersey and former federal prosecutor, where you really kind of grew so acclimated and familiar enough to tell these stories of the mob by first prosecuting them. So how did you pick that path when you became a lawyer? I graduated law school in 2000, so it's always easy for me to calculate how long I've been a lawyer for. I was at a big law firm for three and a half years, had a good experience. You know, people sometimes say, oh, law firm's miserable. I I didn't find that to be true. However, in my heart of hearts, I always wanted to be a federal prosecutor. Hmm. And I actually uh, actually got rejected a couple of times before I got the job. I got rejected in Philly and Brooklyn. And then I got the job in the SDNY, the Southern District of New York, which was sort of strange because reputationally, the SDNY is the toughest one to get in, the most prestigious. So as a friend of mine put it, 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 it's like you lost the silver medal and the bronze medal, but you somehow won the gold. (laughs) But look, you know, there's always luck involved in these things. Who who happens to interview you, how you vibe with that person. But I was at the SDNY and, and the way it works in the SDNY is your first year, you're in general crimes. It's like a freshman dorm. Like you're all in this small hallway crammed together and you're, you're learning as you go. Your second year, you get moved up to narcotics where you start doing more complicated cases, wiretaps, multi-defendant cases, that kind of thing. And then at the end of year two is this sort of important moment where you have to decide, and it's sort of this game, I guess, you know, a little bit of give and take, which of the six or seven senior units you want to go to. And I really had my heart set on going to organized crime because during my first couple of years in the office, I would see we were trying these 
real mobsters. I mean, it was like the movies. I would, if I could, if I had time, I would go over to the courthouse and watch these trials. And you saw, I saw John Gotti on trial and I saw these cooperators, Michael DeLeonardo testifying. And it was like better than watching a movie. And Seriously. I, I didn't, I didn't have any better reason for it than this is fast. Like, this is awesome. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to do this? And so I, I went into OC and I was there for my next six and a half years. I became the deputy chief, then the co-chief of the unit. And as I talk about in the podcast, and we'll talk about here, I ended up trying all manner of mobsters for all manner of crimes there. Uh, it's so pure. I love that you're like, it seemed <laughs> awesome. Like, it, and, it, and it does. I, I appreciate the reasoning and your candor on that. So I have been to that courthouse once myself to see okay. Allison Mack be sentenced. This was just a couple of months ago. So I understand the compulsion to to want to witness. I'm not even a law student. Yeah. But it makes me wonder, did people show up to their trials out of curiosity, just lay people, citizens oh, like me? That's a great question. And the answer is absolutely. So he, here's what the, I'm going to break down for you, the population in the viewing gallery of the court. Wonderful. Right? It's public. All this is public, right? Yep. So first of all, obviously you have family members of the defendant. Yeah. And that could that could be an adventure. I mean, you would have some real mob wives there and oh, mob hangers on. I mean, there were stories, true stories of my colleagues who would get into little back and forths, testy back and forths. A friend of mine, I mean, this is in the media, when she was involved in trying John Gotti Jr., as she was walking out, one of the uh, Gotti family members, I forget if it was his wife or mother, sort of sneered something at her. And she's normally a very disciplined person, but we joked to her. This is the one time she let up her guard. She said something, it was in the paper. She said something like, what the hell are you looking at? Or something like that. I didn't do that stuff. I would just <laughs> ignore them and walk by. But I definitely had people hissing at me and, you know, you're wow. a rat and you're So that's one population. Then you have media there to varying extents. Sometimes sure. just a, a local reporter with a notepad, sometimes the New York Times and everything in between. And then you have this, um, you have curious people. I remember one time a school group, a group that was clearly students, I think high school students came in and we were, I think we were in the process of describing a sort of grisly murder. And I had enough presence of mind to figure out who was the teacher and say, it's great that you're here. This is public. This, this will be educational. Right. Just know that today we're going to be talking about someone getting shot. And he was like, great, awesome, perfect. <laughs> Kids are going to um, love this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, and then you have your obviously friends and family, I said, of the defendant, but then you also have this sort of small group of just court watchers. There are people who, usually older folks, retired folks who who know what's going on in the court and they look for, ooh, that's going to be an inter interesting trial and they come watch. And again, God bless. It, it's a public system. It's supposed to be that way. And and I always yeah. actually li liked it when we had an, a, a, a packed courtroom. It was It's an adrenaline rush. I guess it's like, you know, if you're an athlete or a rock star, you don't want to play to an empty crowd. You're really focusing on the jury. But but I, I found that to be energizing. Yeah. And there's a performance aspect to it. And I guess I'm becoming one of these um, these elderly people who's keeping their eye <laughs> on the court rosters. I just it occurred to me so late in in loving true crime and following cases that, oh, I can participate in my own way yeah. by watching. And I'm right here in New York. Why wouldn't I? So there's a few things I would like to attend. But, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking about this idea that I've heard many lawyers say, it's like, may the best story win and the best story always yeah. wins. And it certainly sounds like you you allude to that in the podcast that you had quite the job because the lore around mafiosa and like the culture and gangsters is such a, a compelling story. So how did you tell your story well when even jurors could be captivated by kind of the the glamour? And we'll get to that, why that happens, but the glamour and the intrigue around even the crimes. So it's a great phrase and a great saying, the best story wins. And there's some truth to it, but I would qualify it. And Murray okay. Richmond, who's a legendary mob lawyer, defense lawyer, who I interview in one of the episodes of the podcast. I mean, what a riveting guy he is. It was a great episode. As you can tell from the episode, we're close. And I really, you know, we both have a lot of admiration and, and, and affection for each other. But Murray talks about that. Murray says something like, it's a romance. You're romancing the jury. You're, you're, you're trying to win them over with humor, with charm, with this and that. And, and that's true to an extent. That's more the defense lawyer's role than yeah. the prosecutor's role, right? As the prosecutor, not to say you have to be a robot or an automaton. You shouldn't be. But your job is to be clear and credible and, and to get the evidence through to the jury in a way that they'll understand and that they'll believe. And I used to sort of say to, to other prosecutors when I became more senior and became a supervisor— 
you know, sometimes you're only as cool as your evidence, right? And, mm. and sometimes, and I've had both extremes in mob cases, and I talk about both of them in the podcast. I mean, the case I tried with Murray, it was a murder case where Murray represented a boss, and he's very complimentary. He says in the podcast it was the single best jury address that I've ever seen a prosecutor give in 50 years or 40 years as a defense lawyer, which was uh, a great compliment. I was thrilled that Murray said it on the record. <laughs> but I will say, like, the evidence that I had in that case was overwhelming and compelling. And it was like pretty much anybody could have been riveting with the evidence that we had, including, as we talk about in the episode, we dug up a dead body that had been missing in the woods for seven Sheesh. years. So I got to say to the jury, you know, did, did this witness know where the bodies were buried? Literally, yes. On the other hand, I had the first mob case I ever did. Our evidence sucked. It was weak and the charges were weak. And the other thing that happened, and I talk about this in the podcast as well, is the jury started to sort of develop this affection for the defendant. Right. He was a likable, funny, charming guy. He didn't testify. They never testify, these mobsters, but we played tapes of him. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I talk about how at one point we sort of noticed they seem to be enjoying these tapes a little too much. <laughs> And uh, we ended up, the jury hung, meaning they couldn't come to a unanimous verdict. We, we then retried him and convicted him. But in the retrial, we went from playing, I think we played 90 tapes the first time to like 10 the second time. We were sure. like, get rid of all the ones where he's funny and likable. And so that's absolutely a phenomenon that we had to be aware of. Yeah, Sure. And now you're in private practice as a defense attorney. I mean, do you think the bigger burden is on the prosecution? It, it, it is like to tell that or to fight against the narrative yeah. of who's got the better story. I mean, the burden technically is on right. the prosecution. So now that you've done both and been on both sides of the courtroom, what's harder? Well, so I, I've never defended a trial on the defense side, okay. but- but I will say this. The answer is it defend, the defense side is harder. You're right that if you look at the textbook and it is the law, the prosecution has the burden of proof and it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And we all have our shtick that we do with the jury on that. That said, it's way harder to be a defense lawyer. And again, Murray and I talk about this a bit for a couple of reasons. One is the vast majority of trials result in convictions. I mean, that's just yeah. the statistical truth. Start with that. But number two is the stakes are sort of different for the lawyers because, you know, if we lose a case as prosecutors or have a hung jury, and I had a couple and I talk about them, it's very disappointing on a personal level. You feel like all the months of effort that you put in were sort of wasted. You, maybe you feel like justice wasn't done. But you know what? You go home and you have dinner and you go to bed and you wake up the next day. If you're a defense lawyer, I mean, and Murray talks about this, and Murray was a defendant. I mean, Murray talks about in, in, the, in the podcast how he, he himself was charged with a crime in the 70s and defended yes. himself. And, and I, I guess I won't give away what happened, but maybe you can infer people if, if, if you know that he's still practicing. Unbelievable. But I ask him, Murray, what was it like to hear United States versus Murray Richmond? He says it was the most traumatic thing you can go through. And if you're a defense lawyer, I mean, to have to sit there with your client while a jury comes out and announces whether he will be... Yeah. Guilty or not guilty. And if, if he's guilty, he's probably going away for life. If it's a murder case, Murray's was not a murder case. But I mean, that is a burden, not in the legal sense, but a burden that I think is greater than the one that prosecutors bear. Yeah. And such an important one. And you use the word adversary. I mean, how do you look at, I loved that interview so much and I appreciated it so much because it was both sides of the, the trial coming together for this beautiful discussion about, <laughs> you know, mutual respect and both yeah. are so needed for our system to thrive. But you also said win or loss. I mean, both parties view it as a win or a loss. And when you're talking yeah. about justice, that's really complicated too. Like how do you, because both are going to view a victory as something different and justice. You're right. And, and, and if I was, we are trained, and if I was speaking in a more formal setting, here's the spiel I would give you. I would say, we prosecutors don't think in terms of wins and losses. It's just justice. But, like, let's be real. Of course we do. I mean, of right. course we're of course we elated when we get a guilty verdict because we believe justice has been done. Of course we're devastated when we don't. Let's be real here. Yeah, so Murray and I, you know, the term adversary is a technical term. And, and, and as well as Murray and I get along in the episode and have chemistry with one another, we also, and we talk about this, I mean— we disagree on several big things in the podcast itself, but we went at it. I mean, these, you know, I had several cases with him, including a murder case. I mean, the stakes don't get any higher than that. His client was convicted, was sentenced to life, died in prison. And so we, you, you bet we went at it. I guess the best 
analogy I can make is like a boxing match, right? You, you see two boxers and they're punching the crap out of each other and you think, boy, I guess, I, I guess those guys hate each other. But you know what? When the bell rings and it's over, they hug, you know? And and, right. and and I guarantee you boxers are more friendly with one another and more much more likely to go out to dinner with one another than, you know, they are with people who watch boxing matches or something right. like that. And the other thing was, I never made it personal. And, and and that's why I was able to win the trust and the respect of people like Murray. And, and I think you can hear this throughout the podcast, whether it's an FBI agent I'm talking to, one of my former cooperators I'm talking to, a, a defense lawyer, my fellow prosecutors. It, it was never personal for me. And there are stories of this. Again, this is stuff you can read about. But prosecutors have gotten in physical altercations with defense lawyers in that courthouse, shoving matches, yelling matches. I didn't go down that road. Believe me, I, look, I'm not, not to say like, I, I mean, I definitely have a temper. And I would definitely get very frustrated, but I never let it boil over to the point where it got personal between a defense lawyer and me. But we have different roles. And and as yeah. you say, Rebecca, our system depends on that adversarial process. That is what our system is. Right, right. Okay, so let's, this is, this was really exciting for me to hear in your podcast because there's a huge parallel. Dialogue listeners will, will get it. You are really exploring, and in particular, one episode with a psychologist, Maria... Konnikova. Konnikova. The why around the mystique and the allure and the culture's curiosity with the mob. And I do that too with true crime. So it's yeah. a really similar interest level and intrigue. You spend a lot of time on the podcast getting at that, but maybe for our listeners who haven't listened yet, let's unpack some of it. And I also want to put forth, my husband and I listened together and I said, well, I know why, because you guys were about to talk about why. And I said, here's what I okay. think. Yeah, tell me. And I said, it's the interest I think is safe because if you're not in the mob, you feel removed from it yes. and you're not at risk. And my husband's like, I don't think so. And I was wondering if that was a female or a gender perspective. And then he huh. said, he thinks it's because there's a code of ethics within an organized crime structure and that people are fascinated by that, that there's rules within this like, you know, lawless sort of behavior. So I'm, I'm guessing it might be a little bit of both. So that's where we're coming from. So why don't you talk about your vantage point? As much as I'd like to declare a winner as between you and your husband, <laughs> you're both right. Oh, and, and and Maria and I, who, who Maria's had this fascinating career where she she's this genius who's a I think she has a doctorate in psychology. She's written about she's written best selling books about the psychology behind criminals and why we're interested in criminals. And she goes, by the way, went on to become a professional a championship level professional poker player, which we Wild. alluded to in the episode. I mean, yeah. what a you know, but I think what I would boil down to after talking to Maria is sort of maybe these three or four factors, okay. the two you said. So the one you said, which is there's a distance. I, there, she she puts a name on it. I think it's like psychological distancing, yes. but the notion that these people won't hurt me. I mean, look, we all fear drunk drivers because they can hit anybody, but there is a feeling and there's some truth to it. The mob doesn't just randomly break into innocent people's homes. The mob won't come up to you and shake you down unless you're in certain businesses in certain areas, right? <laughs> and that's not their, to say it's their fault. But there is a bit of safe distancing there. That, that's certainly one, one reason. Your husband is correct on another reason. There's this notion that they have a code of ethics rules. And they do, and Marie and I, and this comes up on many of the episodes, they do have these rules. However, they are a band of crooks and criminals, <laughs> so they break them Oh, you know, very frequently, whenever it's convenient or profitable, and, and mm. we talk about what some of those rules are, there's a couple other reasons that, that I think. I asked Maria, and she agrees, I believe there's a racial element to it. I think the fact that they're white, I mean, by definition, the, the, the Italian Cosa Nostra is white, and you have to be Italian to get it. And by the way, they, by and large, are virulently racist. I mean, the stuff we used to pick yeah. up on wiretaps and, and bugs was just like over the top, anti-everything, anti-Semitic, anti, you know, I, I mean, homophobic and beyond. But I think for the general public over history, especially back in the 70s and 80s, there was more of a willingness to accept and embrace your Don Corleone to use a fictional character, your John Gotti to use a non-fictional character than a black criminal leader or a Hispanic criminal leader. So really interesting. Yeah, and Maria agrees. Maria thinks that, that that was part of the broader public acceptance of these groups. And then the fourth factor is the media. And we talk about, it's really sort of a chicken and an egg phenomenon. Do we love movies and shows like Godfather, Goodfellas, Sopranos, Donnie Brasco? 
because we're obsessed with the mob or are we obsessed with the mob because of those very successful shows and movies? And I think it's probably both of those things. So there's a lot of factors at play here. But look, people love, and you know, you root for Tony Soprano. You know, maybe in real life, people even root and sympathize with, with the John Gottis, but people don't root for the leaders of the Latin Kings and people don't root for the leader. These are, you know, real gangs of, of the Albanian crime syndicates. And, you know, so there's something about the mob that captures the public imagination. I am so thrilled to announce that Stamps.com is a sponsor of the show because I personally use and rely on Stamps.com. If you have ever received a t-shirt, mug, note, or sticker from yours truly, it has arrived to you via Stamps.com. Since 1998, Stamps.com has been an indispensable tool for nearly 1 million businesses. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS right to your computer. Whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is a computer and a standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. Within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send it. And you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from USPS and UPS. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. No traffic, no lines. Cut the confusion out of shipping. With Stamps.com's new Rate Advisor tool, you can compare shipping rates and timelines to easily find the best option. Save time and money with Stamps.com. There is no risk. And with my promo code POD, that's P-O-D, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in POD, P-O-D. That's Stamps.com, promo code POD. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. That is such an interesting point, the racial component. Like, what does that reveal about us, though? Yeah. It's not good. Um, yeah. But I can't quite articulate what that's making me feel, that there's, like, a weird, unconscious bias like, yeah. towards well, white criminals. That's just... I, th- I think that's exactly what I think it reflects a bias to where we're more willing to, we generally are more willing to accept, embrace a white criminal in, in some portion because they're white. I think it's an institutional bias, an inherent bias that we, and again, I'm speaking, when I say we, I mean, we as a culture, as a country have, and yeah. we become aware of it in, in, in some areas, but I think it's, I, I think it's, it's absolutely a factor in the way the public perceives and receives certain criminals and accused criminals. And do you think there's anything related about how they were first treated and or stigmatized or not in this country versus maybe other communities of color and yeah, the crimes we more associate with like gang and, and drug industry. It's interesting because again, Maria talks about this in the episode. You know, she says that at first when, when the Italian organized crime groups really emerged in the early part of the 1900s, they were other, you know, there right. was a lot of anti-Italian sentiment and, and propaganda out there and they were discriminated against and they emerged as a way not to make an excuse, but to, to gain a foothold to, to, in certain industries. And, and the interesting thing is if you look over history and over time, as a group, the newer a group is, the sort of more aggressive, I guess I would say, their organized crime groups are. And I'll give you an example. I mean, as time went by, the Italian mafia became less sort of extreme, more accepted, more un- understood. But even in my time as a prosecutor, you would see emerging criminal gangs, criminal groups. I mean, the two big ones that really emerged and got bigger in my time, three, were were the Chinese gangs based in Chinatown, which were literally two blocks. We used to go walk to lunch in Chinatown and we would go, oh yeah, this block is controlled by these guys. They're selling heroin here. Albanians became a big emerging group and at times conflicted. I did cases where at times they were in battles with the Italian mob. And the Russian mafia also started to emerge. So I think as newer groups get established here, you'll see organized crime groups rise up with them and around them and and over time sort of become more and more established and maybe even accepted. 
Could it also be their food is so delicious and we just love it so much that we embrace I mean, them? <laughs> I think food comes up in every episode of this show. I'm upset. I, I mean, I asked uh, Jack Garcia, who was the FBI agent who went undercover in one of the episodes. I asked him, what was the light? What would you eat in a day? And Jack's yes. a big guy. Jack talks about it on the episode. He's, he's six. I think he says six, eight, 300 something pounds. And he lays out the day worth of food. And I was like, uh, you know, breakfast and we have eggs and bacon at noon and, yeah. <laughs> and waffles. And then it like goes through like meals that you and I've never heard of. Yeah. But, but my favorite detail from, from that little bit was Jack said, you know, he's playing the part. He's an FBI agent, but he's deep in the mob as an undercover. And he, and I said, what, what would you order or something like that? And Jack says, the move is you go in and you don't know menus. You say to the server, what are we eating? What are we eating? <laughs> yeah. So I, I say, man, I would love to try to pull that off. Like, I would love to just go to my Italian sp- spot here in, in, in Jersey and just sit down and go, no, what am I eating? And they would go, what are you talking about? Here's the I menu. know. They'd it wouldn't work right. for me. You tell yeah. us. I know. Same here. I'm half yeah. Italian from New Jersey. So I'm just, maybe this is all just like a really deep rooted, like embracing of Italian culture that people love. And that makes an easier way in. Yeah. But okay. I do want to unpack these rules because you do reference sure. them several times in the episodes, but here's a weird confession. I have never watched The Sopranos. <laughs> I have not watched watched the Godfather movies, I feel like my, you know, interest in, in mafia culture is by osmosis. It's just in the air we breathe, but I've not done the deep dive work. Most people I know have. So I understand generally this code of ethics, but could you really unpack the rules? Like what are they? I'm going to give you the rules. And for each one, I'm going to tell you how often it was violated. How about that? I love it. Yes. Okay. One of them, the number one rule is omerta, which is Italian for silence. Okay. Violated quite frequently. That means, and again, it's funny, there, there's rules and then it's almost like in the law, like there's different interpretations within the mob. There's strict sure. people and there's more, you know, more forgiving people. Certainly can't cooperate, right? And, and they'll kill you if they find out you are cooperating and they can kill you. Some people think it means, some mobsters think it means you can't even plead guilty. Others say, look, you, sometimes you have to plead guilty. You know what I right. mean? Right. You can never admit you're in the mob. You're not supposed to acknowledge it. You're not supposed to ever do media. And again, that gets broke. All of those get broken. I mean, people flip in, in, in probably increasingly so in recent years. You now see mobsters doing media. I mean, not go- mostly guys who have flipped or out of the mob for other reasons. So that one, I, w- I would say, is fairly frequently broken. Okay, another one. No dealing in drugs. That one is broken all the damn time. The reason, and we talk about this in some of the episodes, the reason is it was seen as just not b- beneath us in the mob. I mean, you hmm. know, they're criminals, so I don't know how they draw these lines. But also, more practically, and I think I think Michael Visconti, who's my cooperator, who comes on an episode with me, a great episode, explains that, like, it just wasn't good business because the penalties got so severe in the 80s and 90s. And so we decided to say, but Michael says, and several guests say, but every one of these guys is a hypocrite. They all, they all deal drugs. They all made money off it. The, the forefather, the founding fathers of the mob were all drug dealers, heroin pushers, that kind of thing. That is almost complete hypocrisy. Hmm. You don't mess around, fool around with another guy's wife, sister, whatever. That one's broken infrequently, but occasionally. You know, I can give a couple examples. <laughs> Another one, though, that is is religiously observed, and we talk about this on my episode with Jim Galliano, who who was in charge of making sure Sammy the Bull Gravano stayed safe after he flipped. And Jimmy says, you know, Sammy's family stayed in Queens or Brooklyn or wherever they lived, yeah. and they didn't move, they didn't relocate. He had to get whisked away. Jim was part of the team that made sure he was securely uh, kept because there's a rule that you don't go after, you don't. You don't attack, you don't physically assault family members. And that one I've never heard being violated in the mob, I will say. I don't know why I had that so backwards. I thought that was one of their like go-to warning signs. Like, you know, I'll get your daughter or your your kid or your brother. No, Um, maybe, maybe, look, maybe as a threat. I mean, that, right? They'll threaten anything. Yeah. But no, I can't cite an instance for you oh. of somebody going after another mobster's family member. A related rule is you don't go after, threaten or attack a judge or a prosecutor. Now, that was yes. that was violated a couple times in like the 70s, 80s, but it really has been observed for the last 20, 30 years. And the reason for that, again, is not because they're good guys. It's because it's just bad business. Like, look, if you kill me, let's say, for example, when I was a prosecutor, your case doesn't go away. If your case got dismissed, if the rule was kill the prosecutor, case yeah. goes away, like we'd all be dead 20 times over. Sure. But 
the, the thing is, if you come after me or threaten me or whatever, A, they just plug in the next version of me and B, all holy hell rains down on you because nothing will get the FBI and DEA and ATF and U.S. Attorney's Office on your ass like trying to do something to a, a prosecutor and sure. a judge. So those are the biggies. I mean, there's other sort of more technical ones, like if you have a beef, which is a technical term they have, like if you have a dispute, oh, she, he think, uh, you know, I think he owes me 50 grand. He says he only owes me 30 grand. It's almost like an internal court system. You have oh. to, you have to lodge your beef and then you have what's called a sit down and it has to be between people of equal rank and then either they work it out. It's actually like our court system. Either they work it out, they settle it, or if not, it has to go up the chain to like the boss or a capo who decides. So it's like this informal judicial system. That I like this well. for parenting. I could see this with siblings too. This is yeah. good. Um, yeah, it works. Okay. They have a beef and <laughs> yeah. they, then have a sit down. And, Allow yeah, exactly. them to work it out and then go to the parents yeah. only if needed. Yeah, exactly. I like that. I like that. What about the killing rules? You you did yeah. mention that. And I know that's very, you know, trigger mm-hmm. warning for anybody. Like they do kill people. Um, yes. What are the like cans and can'ts around that? Yeah. You can't just kill someone because you feel like it. And we talk about this on some of the episodes. It has to go up the line. It has to be authorized by the boss. And there's a lot of reasons for that because they may not want certain people killed. It's dangerous to start killing people. Murders lead to murder charges, which lead to cooperators, right? Because you're much more likely to flip if you're looking at life behind bars. I asked Michael Visconti, the cooperator who committed serious crimes on behalf of the Genovese family, I said, now, you were, he was never asked to commit a murder. He probably would have if he hadn't flipped. It was only a matter of time. But I asked Michael on the episode, I say, would you have killed if Angelo, who was his capo, told you to? And he says, he doesn't hesitate. He says, yes. And I ask him why. And he says, well, and this is another aspect. It's not optional, by the way. Like right. if, a, if a boss gives you an order to kill and you, you don't have the option to decline and they may kill you if you decline for, I think, obvious reasons. A, they have to have chain of command. B, now you're one more person who knows about this murder. So if, if, if a boss has to go to person A and person A has the option of going, no thanks, boss. Now he has to go to person B. Guess what? There's two people who can flip against him, person A, person B. So there absolutely are very tight rules around, around mob murders. There's actually an interesting case that we did where Curtis Sliwa, who is a fairly well-known guy, he founded the Guardian Angels in New York City. Sounds he wears familiar. that like, yeah, the, yeah. like red satin jacket yes. and the hat. He's actually running for mayor of New York City right now as the Republican candidate as we speak here. I mean, you know, very, that's um, where I, I'd most recently heard. Him. Yeah. OK. He yeah, has his yeah. own radio show. So the Gotti's had Curtis Sliwa attacked years ago. He was on the radio attacking John Gotti Sr. And so John Gotti Jr. ordered two of his people, one of whom ended up cooperating, to give Curtis Sliwa what was termed a hospital beating, meaning what it sounds like, beat yep. him so badly that he goes to the hospital. But don't kill him. But don't kill him. And what happened was one of the guys went overboard and brought a gun and shot Sliwa a bunch of times. And Sliwa, Sliwa lived. He's still alive today. He, it's, a, it's a miraculous story. He, he, he fights his way out. They had him in a car. He fights his way out of the car. They drop him on the street. He lives. He'll tell you all about it. He's testified about it. But the thing is, our cooperator, who was not the guy with the gun, said, after this happened, he said, I was terrified. I said, oh, my God, they're, we just killed this guy or tried to kill this guy without approval from the bosses they're gonna kill us oh my gosh yeah and he had to go back and use all this goodwill and explain to people i had no idea this guy went off the rails i had no idea when he popped up with the gun i was as shocked as anybody and he managed to get himself out of trouble with that so yeah there's very strict rules about this stuff yeah what a tricky line in the sand to draw too about like beating someone to the point of hospitalization and not killing like that could go awry pretty easily i would think more often than not I love that there's gradations of this stuff. There's like beating and then there's hospital beating and then there's, you know, on up the line. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So interesting. Okay. This is crazy. And I didn't include it in our uh, pre-interview notes. So this could feel very out of left field for you. Go for it. Uh, But I have to, I have to ask. I was listening to the interview again, going back to the one with Maria Konnikova and she was talking about her work with con artists and the and likening them to to mobsters. I want to draw another parallel. I wonder if you see this. The way she was describing the way you were both talking about their influence and the way they leverage power, I also could see this correlating to cult leaders. What oh. do you think? Yeah, I do think there's something there. I mean, look, 
the mob is sort of a cult. I it mean, is. Think of, Right. Yes. I mean, they have they have rituals. They have rules like they actually will prick your finger when you get in. Right. Like and draw blood. They have the all powerful leader. Right. The the, the bo- It's not a democracy. The boss. Right. What the boss says goes. They indoctrinate their people in certain beliefs. Yes. Insider language. Yeah. Insider language customs. And the thing is, a lot of these guys are super charismatic. Not all of them. I mean, like some of these guys, we used to, as we used to just phrase it, were just mopes, like loser uh-huh. guys, just hangers on. But some of these guys are super charismatic. And I talked about that. Sometimes a jury can pick up on that. Even some of the cooperators who I had. I mean, I had cooperators who were very straightforward. I had cooperators who, who were very off-putting. And I had cooperators. And I think Michael Visconti, who you can hear in the episode, is very compelling and very charismatic yes. and likable. And And I think... As with a lot of industries, I think the people who rise to the top tend to be the people who are charismatic and who know how to interact with people, know how to persuade people, know how to get people to do their bidding. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do think there's a, some parallel there. That's so interesting to me. And also this misapplication of talent. You know, I oh, remember gosh. you guys speaking out loud like, man, if these guys applied themselves in an honest, straightforward profession, they'd who knows what they could have done. And I feel like that about some cult leaders really could have done so much good in the world. And instead they, they led so much destruction. Yeah. I mean, some of these guys, I I think some of these guys would have been losers no matter what, but some of them could have absolutely been leaders in, in, in industry and finance and even law. Some of the, by by the way, on the law thing, one of my favorite recordings that we ever got, you know, you would, we would get, we would put bugs in places, sometimes in a restaurant or whatever. We'd have someone wearing a wire. And there's one recording where, there, someone they know has gotten arrested and convicted by a jury, and he's in the Southern District of New York, and the mobsters are talking about his chances on appeal. And one guy goes, well, the Third Circuit's no good for appeal. And the guy goes, no, 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 Third Circuit's Philly. We're New York. We're Second Circuit. And I'm like, wow, this is like law school level stuff. Like, That's um, fascinating. So, That's amazing. Yeah, maybe so, Maybe those guys would have been good lawyers. Who knows? It's very possible. Okay, so... For someone like me who hasn't watched any films or television around this, yeah. what do you think is your the best, most accurate depiction of mob life in film or TV? My podcast is first, but after my podcast, <laughs> Sopranos is the most is the most accurate. Excuse me, let me tell you something. When America opened the floodgates and let all us Italians in, what do you think they were doing it for? Because because they were trying to save us from poverty? No, they did it because they needed us. They needed us to build their cities and dig their subways and to make them richer. The Carnegies and the Rockefellers, they needed worker bees, and there we were. But some of us didn't want to swarm around their hive and lose who we were. We wanted to stay Italian and preserve the things that meant something to us, honor and family and loyalty. And some of us wanted a piece of the action. Because it's the, it's the most de-glamorized. Right. I mean, you know, if you watch The Godfather, it's almost like operatic. It, it's sweeping score and beautifully cinematic and that Pacino and De Niro and Marlon Brando. And, but the Sopranos shows what a miserable grind this is for the mobsters, right? I mean, you know, everyone thinks of Goodfellas. You think of the, the scene where they whisk Ray Liotta into the uh, Copacabana and put his table in front. In Sopranos, you see, it's so, it, it's such a long, hard grind for these guys. I mean, they spend so many hours chasing down meaningless leads, you know, looking for a score, fighting. Oh gosh, the infighting, the, the, the squabbling between these guys, the time waster, you know, Michael Visconti says there was a lot of standing around and I wasn't a standing around guy. You have guys who barely can make a buck and they're barely getting by in the mob and they don't kick them out or anything. And look, you can get killed. You can get arrested for sure. I mean, all these guys, like, I don't know how many mobsters ever have made it through a long career in the mob without getting killed, beaten, or incarcerated for a significant period of time or flipping. Yeah. So, and and then if you flip, your whole life is disrupted, you know? So it's just a matter of sort of bad outcomes. Even guys who are seen as like wild successes have done five, you know, within the mob, have done five, six, eight year stints several times over. So it's a miserable, difficult, Life, but it also has the bizarre, quirky, you know, incidents that happen. You see on Sopranos, everyone laughs. Oh my God, they they go to their kids' play. 
you know, yeah. that kind of right, thing. Right, right. Well, it's the, that, I mean, that's know. what good art is. It's finding relatability yeah. even to someone you could never relate to. There's I think a, I have to watch it. You, you do. There, there's a great thing that Michael and I talk about Visconti where he and his crew, because the leader of the crew was not allowed to leave the state of New Jersey, he was on parole. They choose as their meeting place, typically mob meeting places would be these social clubs, these storefronts sure. that they own. These guys chose the bowling alley, the Fairlawn bowling alley. Yes, I remember and, this. And he talks about their bowling team and how they'd be bowling against these regular guys. And I did ask Michael because we had a guy recording them in there and the tapes were miserable because there's bowling pins exploding every three seconds. So it would be like, you know, hey, we got to get the guy psh, bowling pin. We got to tell the guy. Psh, go. And I asked Michael, I never got to ask him this before. I asked him, I said, did you guys do that on purpose? Did you choose the bowling alley just because in case someone was recording you? He went, no, we weren't that smart. <laughs> so. I, I That had to be by design. I just, I almost, it's too perfect. It's like, what dumb luck. I mean. Not according to Michael. He said they're too, yeah. they were never smart enough to think of that. So. That's really funny. So yeah. looking back on all these defendants, you've mentioned that some could charm or captivate a jury, even from past testimony that they heard or, or bugs or even their presence, who knows, in the courtroom. Who sure. was the most charming to you or appealing? And who <laughs> who was the scariest? Who, who really did, despite knowing oh. that they probably weren't going to touch you, which I'm sure is why you and your family, you know, could feel comfortable you doing this with you doing yep. this job. Like who made your skin crawl a little bit? Okay. So let me, th that's a great, two great questions. Most charming was a guy named Ciro Perone, C-I-R-O was his okay. first name. Ciro was about 80 years old when we arrested him. Little guy, shorter than me, um, always tan. We used to marvel at Ciro's yes. tan. It didn't matter what time of day it was. The FBI agents would do surveillance and they would say it was in the middle of November. They'd say Ciro was outside tanning. He would have like, you know, those old fashioned foily things sure. they hold under their face. Yeah. He had a grace about him. He would dress super stylish. He didn't wear a suit. He would wear like. A, a slick looking leather jacket, but not like a seedy looking, like a cool leather <laughs> jacket in front of the jury. And the jury um, would hear his stories in the tape. And he was funny. He would tell these funny stories. He would have these ter turns of phrase. He used to say things like, uh, you know, I couldn't run for dog catcher and get get elected, you know, like and, and he was um reported reputedly a ballroom dance champion in like the 50s and 60s. Amazing. And the guy got away. The guy between the time we arrested him, when we arrested him, we got his rap sheet. Whenever you arrest someone, they print out the criminal history and you flip through it. Ciro had one prior conviction for burglary in 1955. Oh so the gosh. guy went. 50 something years avoiding because he kept a low profile. He was old yeah. school. He was like, you don't go in front of the media. You don't do what he hated John Gotti because John Gotti sure. was in the media. And so Ciro was old school. And as you can probably tell now, I was kind of found him interesting and charming. You know what I mean? And after we convicted him, I think I tell this story the second time we convicted him and the judge, he's 80 years old and we all know what's going to happen next. We're going to, we, the prosecutors are going to ask the judge to throw him in jail. He yeah. may not ever be free a day again. Judge says, let's take a five minute recess. I go out to the bathroom. I come back in. Ciro's standing right there. I didn't speak to Ciro. Like we didn't have any kind of back and forth. Again, he's old school and he's standing there with his lawyer. And I could tell in a way that he was like waiting for me. And the lawyer was waiting for me. And I turned towards him and Ciro just goes, Hey kid, you did a good job. No hard feelings. And oh I was my like, gosh. What a gentleman. Okay. I guess. Yeah. And then, and then here's the postscript. He gets five years. Yeah. I actually used to wonder like, is he going to get out alive or not? Does his five years come out, comes out, lives a handful, three, four, five, six more months. And then he dies. And I got to tell wow. you, like, was I glad that he didn't die in jail? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was. I mean, you know, we didn't convict him of a murder. It was just racketeer, not just, but it was racketeering and loan sharking and gambling and extortion. But like, if the man can die in his home as opposed to in prison, God bless. Absolutely. So I should probably hate him more, but I don't. <laughs> scariest. Scariest was a pair. I'm going to, this is a tie between two brothers, Freddie and Ty Gius. These are the other two guys in the case, in the trial with Murray. Murray had the, Richmond represented the boss. These yeah. were the two hitmen. They're Greek, so they can never get made, but they were still associated. Okay. The, these guys are the only mobsters who ever, I believe, killed for sport. Like, Ugh. You know, usually the mob killed for business reasons. They thought you were cooperating and needed to shut you up. They needed to, they thought you were stealing from them, whatever. These guys, one of the murders that we charged and convicted them for, they basically did on their own against the rules. They were in Massachusetts, so it was a little bit different, but affiliated with New York. But they killed the guy because essentially a big part of the reason was they were like, we need to build our respect on the streets. We need to drop somebody so people will know we did that and they'll fear us. 
the postscript is we convicted them as well, and they they all got life sentences. And then a couple years later, in I think it was 2018, I open up you know my phone one morning and it's blowing up, and everyone goes, "Holy crap! Isn't that your guy who just killed Whitey Bulger in prison?" And indeed, Freddie Gius was the one who Whitey Bulger, of course, is the legendary mob figure who was killed in prison. Had his eyes gouged out, according to some reports, had his head beaten in so badly. They, you know, I mean, there's a little bit different reports out there, but the point is somebody, and it was Freddie Gius, according to all these news reports, murdered Whitey Bulger while they were both inmates together in federal prison in this really gruesome, grotesque way. So, oh Freddy, my gosh. Yeah, Freddie Gius is probably the only mobster I ever prosecuted who I would not sit down in a room with unless it was, you know, serious cops court mandated <laughs> yeah exactly i'm glad he's an outlier i'm glad you know i guess i'm grateful for those weird codes of conduct that it doesn't just attract you know a violent person who wants to just wreak havoc i guess that's what serial killers do instead they just do their own thing yeah i think i think if you talk to and look i've talked to a lot of murderers i mean a lot of my cooperators have committed murders and i think uniformly they didn't relish it any more than any sane. They're all sane people. Yeah. They did not enjoy getting the order, but they all dutifully did it. Not that they were reluctant either. They were absolutely willing and 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 liable and guilty in every sense of the word, legal and moral and everything else. But they didn't go, oh, goody, the boss just gave me this hit. They would go, oh, right. boy, you know, here we go. Right. The thought doesn't originate within them. It's handed down because of the... Well, the business so, they signed up for, but yeah, but and but there were times when when they would say if they were powerful enough, I wanted to kill this guy, and I sent up word and asked for permission and that kind of thing. So yeah, okay. I mean, but but it wasn't for like the sport of it or the charge of it. It was because yeah. they believed it was necessary for their business. Interesting. We don't put mobsters in serial killer category, though. They had yeah. many kills under their their belts, so to speak. It's kind of interesting. I mean, Sammy Gravano killed, well, was involved at least in the planning of 19 murders. I mean, that um, is up there. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think the distinction, I guess, would be there's a notion that serial killers kill randomly or arbitrarily yes. or, or to fulfill some, you know, bizarre, sadistic Psychological, desire. Yeah. yeah whereas yeah. The, the top mob killers, a guy like Gravano with 19 murders, all of them, there's an explanation for it. Not, not, I'm not saying a justification, but they would go, well, that guy was cooperating. That guy was stealing from yeah. us. That guy had killed one of our guys, so we had to get revenge. Like, there's at least some sort of, you know, I, I guess, rational. I'm using justification quotes, or, quotes here. Yeah. Just, right. In their minds, justification. Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, will there be a season two of Up Against the Mob? <laughs> I feel like you must have more stories to tell. I do have more stories to tell. I, I, we are working on it. I, I think we are going to do it. I would love to do it. I have a, you know, I could probably do 10 seasons. <laughs> but uh, yeah, look, like I said, Rebecca, in the beginning, I, I did it for the stories. And I find it so fascinating because, and people say, why? Why were you drawn to it? I mean, it's the human drama of it. You get to yes. see the craziest, wildest stories. And, and one of the things I think that comes through from the podcast is these are all people. They're all human beings and they all have foibles. And they all have these moments and fears and insecurities, and it doesn't matter if you're an FBI agent or a defense lawyer or a psychologist or a prosecutor or a mobster. Yeah. And it's sort of this spotlight on the human condition in its raw form. That resonates so deeply. I think that's a lot of my fascination with true crime and just yeah. why humans do what they do, including, you know, victims, survivors, uh, criminals, yeah. and also people like me who just can't stop reading and watching and listening <laughs> to all this stuff. Well, before I let you go, I ask all my guests, if it was yeah. your last meal tonight, what would you eat? Oh, my goodness. Speaking uh, of delicious food. That is good. I am starving right now. Okay, but <laughs> I am going to go I'm gonna, in the spirit of the show. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, look, I'm from Jersey. I'm Jewish, which is sort of like semi-Italian. You totally. Know? Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with an Italian feast. Oh, We're going to start off with some thinly shaved beef carpaccio. Gorgeous. We're going to get, we're going to go fried calamari, but like with a lot of hot peppers on it. Ooh. Right. We're going to go with a thin, it has to be thin, a thin pounded veal parmesan for the main course. And we're going to have a side of, it's got to be like the, the homemade pasta. Mm -hmm. And for dessert, we'll, 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 I guess I have to go cannoli, right? It's, it, it, it's cliche, but I have to go with a cannoli 
and, and a hot black coffee. That is my, and then, I, and then you, and then you can take me off to the, to the chamber. I'm ready I think to go. my grandmother's like getting ready in heaven. She's like, I can hear like the dishes clanking around. She's getting ready <laughs> to make you lunch. That's beautiful. And I love it. My gosh, it was so great to meet you and talk to you. I will point everybody in the show notes with a link to Up Against the Mob, a fantastic podcast. I'm going to listen again, and then I'm going to watch The Sopranos. Ellie, thank you so much for killing the small talk. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. It was a pleasure talking to you. Dialogue is a Yellow Tape Media production, audio engineered by Jason Usry and produced hosted and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian. If you love the podcast, please consider becoming a diehard by signing up at patreon.com slash dialogue. Other ways to support the show? Follow along on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across platforms, and you can now watch most episodes on YouTube by subscribing to my channel, Rebecca Sebastian. For more information or to drop me a note, visit RebeccaSebastian.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and killing the small talk.